Do you believe it's all over, son? He turned. The judge was standing at the bar looking down at him. He smiled. He removed his hat. The great pale dome of his skull shone like an enormous phosphorescent egg in the lamplight. The last of the true. The last of the true. I'd say they're all gone under now, saving me and thee, would you not? He tried to see past him. That great corpus enshadowed him from all beyond. He could hear the woman announcing the commencement of dancing in the hall to the rear. And some are not yet born who shall have cause to curse the Dauphin's soul, said the judge. He turned slightly. Plenty of time for the dance. I ain't studying no dance. The judge smiled. The Tyrolean and another man were bent over the bear. The girl was sobbing, the front of her dress dark with blood. The judge leaned across the bar and seized a bottle and snapped the cork out of it with his thumb. The cork whined off into the blackness above the lamps like a bullet. He rifled a great drink down his throat and leaned back against the bar. You're here for the dance, he said. I got to go. The judge looked aggrieved. Go, he said. He nodded. He reached and took hold of his hat where it lay on the bar, but he didn't take it up, and he didn't move. What man would not be a dancer if he could, said the judge. It's a great thing, the dance. The woman was kneeling and had her arm around the little girl. The candles sputtered, and the great hairy mound of the bear, dead in its crinoline, lay like some monster slain in the commission of unnatural acts. The judge poured the tumbler full where it stood empty alongside the hat and nudged it forward. Drink up, he said. Drink up. This night thy soul may be required of thee. He looked at the glass. The judge smiled and gestured with the bottle. He took up the glass and drank. The judge watched him. Was it always your idea, he said, that if you did not speak, you would not be recognized? You seen me. The judge ignored this. I recognized you when I first saw you, and yet you were a disappointment to me. Then and now. Even so, at the last, I find you here with me. I ain't with you. The judge raised his bald brow. Not, he said. He looked about him in a puzzled and artful way, and he was a passable thespian. I never come here hunting you. What then, said the judge. What would I want with you? I come here same reason as any man. And what reason is that? What reason is what? That these men are here. They come here to have a good time. The judge watched him. He began to point out various men in the room, and to ask if these men were here for a good time, or if indeed they knew why they were here at all. Everybody don't have to have a reason to be someplace. That's so, said the judge. They do not have to have a reason. But order is not set aside because of their indifference. He regarded the judge warily. Let me put it this way, said the judge. If it is so that they themselves have no reason, and yet are indeed here, must they not be here by reason of some other? And if this is so, can you guess who that other might be? No. Can you? I know him well. He poured the tumbler full once more, and he took a drink himself from the bottle, and he wiped his mouth and turned to regard the room. This is an orchestration for an event. For a dance, in fact. 
The participants will be apprised of their roles at the proper time. For now, it is enough that they have arrived. As the dance is the thing with which we are concerned and contains complete within itself its own arrangement and history and finale, there is no necessity that the dancers contain these things within themselves as well. In any event, the history of all is not the history of each, nor indeed the sum of those histories. And none here can finally comprehend the reason for his presence, for he has no way of knowing even in what the event consists. In fact, were he to know, he might well absent himself. And you can see that that cannot be any part of the plan, if plan there be. He smiled. His great teeth shone. He drank. An event, a ceremony, the orchestration thereof. The overture carries certain marks of decisiveness. It includes the slaying of a large bear. The evening's progress will not appear strange or unusual, even to those who question the rightness of the events so ordered. A ceremony, then. One could well argue that there are not categories of no ceremony, but only ceremonies of greater or lesser degree. And deferring to this argument, we will say that this is a ceremony of a certain magnitude, perhaps more commonly called a ritual. A ritual includes the letting of blood. Rituals which fail in this requirement are but mock rituals. Here every man knows the false at once, never doubt it. That feeling in the breast that evokes a child's memory of loneliness, such as when the others have gone and only the game is left with its solitary participant. A solitary game without opponent, where only the rules are at hazard. Don't look away. We're not speaking in mysteries. You of all men are no stranger to that feeling, the emptiness and the despair. It is that which we take arms against, is it not? Is not blood the tempering agent in the mortar which bonds? The judge leaned closer. What do you think death is, man? Of whom do we speak? when we speak of a man who was and is not. Are these blind riddles, or are they not some part of every man's jurisdiction? What is death if not an agency? And whom does he intend toward? Look at me. I don't like craziness. Nor I, nor I, bear with me. Look at them now. Pick a man, any man. That man there, see him? That man, hatless. You know his opinion of the world. You can read it in his face, in his stance. Yet his complaint that a man's life is no bargain masks the actual case with him. Which is that men will not do as he wishes them to. Have never done, never will do. That's the way of things with him. And his life is so balked about by difficulty and become so altered of its intended architecture, that he is little more than a walking hovel, hardly fit to house the human spirit at all. Can he say, such a man, that there is no malign thing set against him? That there is no power and no force and no cause? What manner of heretic could doubt agency and claimant alike? Can he believe that the wreckage of his existence is unentailed? no liens, no creditors, that gods of vengeance and of compassion alike lie sleeping in their crypt, and whether our cries are for an accounting or for the destruction of the ledgers altogether, they must evoke only the same silence, and that it is this silence which will prevail. To whom is he talking, man? Can't you see him? The man was indeed muttering to himself, and peering balefully about the room, wherein it seemed there was no friend to him. A man seeks his own destiny and no other, said the judge, will or nil. Any man who could discover his own fate and elect, therefore, some opposite course could only come at last to that selfsame reckoning at the same appointed time. 
for each man's destiny is as large as the world he inhabits, and contains within it all opposites as well. This desert upon which so many have been broken is vast, and calls for largeness of heart, but it is also ultimately empty. It is hard, it is barren, its very nature is stone. He poured the tumbler full. Drink up, he said. The world goes on. We have dancing nightly, and this night is no exception. The straight and the winding way are one, and now that you are here, what do the years count since last we two met together? Men's memories are uncertain, and the past that was differs little from the past that was not. He took up the tumbler the judge had poured, and he drank and set it down again. He looked at the judge. I've been everywhere, he said. This is just one more place. The judge arched his brow. Did you post witnesses? He said. To report to you on the continuing existence of those places once you'd quit them? That's crazy. Is it? Where is yesterday? Where is Glanton and Brown? And where is the priest? He leaned closer. Where is Shelby? whom you left to the mercies of Elias in the desert? And where is Tate, whom you abandoned in the mountains? Where are the ladies, ah, the fair and tender ladies, with whom you danced at the governor's ball when you were a hero, anointed with the blood of the enemies of the Republic you'd elected to defend? And where is the fiddler, and where the dance? I guess you can tell me. I tell you this. As war becomes dishonored and its nobility called into question, those honorable men who recognize the sanctity of blood will become excluded from the dance, which is the warrior's right, and thereby will the dance become a false dance, and the dancers false dancers. And yet there will be one there always who is a true dancer, and can you guess who that might be? You ain't nothing. You speak truer than you know. But I will tell you. Only that man who has offered himself entire to the blood of war, who has been to the floor of the pit and seen horror in the round, and learned at last that it speaks to his inmost heart, only that man can dance. Even a dumb animal can dance. The judge set the bottle on the bar. Hear me, man, he said. There is room on the stage for one beast and one alone. All others are destined for a night that is eternal and without name. One by one they will step down into the darkness before the footlamps. Bears that dance, bears that don't. <laughs>